there's just a kindness and fire behind the eyes around the folks who really believe that change comes from the ground up. Welcome everybody to The Force for Good. I'm Rick Gertzema, I'm your host, and I'm with the Miller Dewan Foundation. And today I'm delighted <clears throat> to have Zach Williams as our guest. Um, Zach and I met uh, oh, over the last year, we've been working together. Um, Zach has been gracious enough to actually be in Duluth. Um, many of you might have seen him on commercials with a lift bridge behind him. Um, he was a big help with us launching our HOPEX initiative. And um, so what I'd like to do, Zach, if you're willing, is just do a little introduction, a little bit of background about who you are. That would be wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Rick, it's always a pleasure to see you and speak with you. Oh, thank you. The Miller Dwan Foundation for me holds a very special place in my heart. And when you first reached out to me at this point, I guess about a, a year and a half ago, I was really touched by not only your your authenticity, but your passion for the cause. This is your life's work. And for me, what what I'm doing in the mental health advocacy space is part of my life's work. It's part of my healing process. For me, my mental health journey started very early on in life. Uh, I had a lot of anxiety as a child um, that manifested uh, in part uh, and became depression. And also I had obsessive compulsive thoughts and behavior very early on. And so um, I didn't really have an understanding of what it meant to have mental health issues. And so it was hard for me to articulate what I was going through aside from it just being part of the human experience. Sure. Right? So, sure. so I kept a lot of it in. I wasn't able to articulate it in too many ways throughout my childhood and adolescence. Uh, ultimately, what happened was I moved to New York to attend U New York University as an 18 year old two weeks before September 11th. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so for me, I experienced September 11th, the, the terrorist attacks and, and the like as a, as a freshman in college and not really understanding that I needed an outlet to manage what was becoming a lot of dysregulation, what ultimately manifested a trauma as trauma. And so, you know, I started all sorts of unhealthy means of, of medicating myself to manage those mental health uh, experiences. And so, you know, I, I relied upon using things like alcohol and overeating for a, a good chunk of my early adult life and wasn't able to really acknowledge the trauma in any meaningful way for a good period of time over a course of decades. And then, you know, when my father, the entertainer, Robin Williams died by suicide, everything came to a head. Oh, I found okay. It. Sure. Yeah. 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 And I decided to start seeking professional help and was diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, generalized anxiety disorder and depression, and was doing many unhealthy things, but continued self-medicating using alcohol. And then it got to the point where I was like, hey, things need to change. I'm not feeling great. Um, my mental health issues were getting worse. And so a couple of things happened. One is I started realizing that a commitment to service was healing for the trauma. I started first teaching at San Quentin Prison, a financial literacy course, working with a group of, of uh, incarcerated individuals there, but, but also started realizing that I needed to take care of myself if I was going to be of service. So I discovered this positive feedback loop around taking care of myself so I could show up for others. And that created for me an understanding that if I was gonna advocate for systems change and change in the way in which treatment is es established on a on a fair and equal basis around the mental health uh, ecosystem, I was going to first need to take care of myself. Absolutely, and so so in that whole experience of of growing up, 
um, he have this wonderful dad, this this guy who is I think is a genius. Talk a little bit about that experience. I mean, you knew that there was something going on internally with you, um, and you're also part of this this great big picture. What what was that experience like? Well, you know, I, I grew up in San Francisco and and wasn't necessarily privy to the full scope of the limelight that my father was experiencing. And I was, I was shielded from it in, in many different ways. And so I had, I had the good fortune of growing up in a, in a, in what I would consider a reasonably normal upbringing. And, you know, when, when it came to spending time with my father, I was hanging out with him at home. You know, and we would play video games together. He loved Star Trek, therefore I started loving Star Star Trek and and uh, you know science fiction movies. And we would bond through you know our love of science and and games and and that for me was my experience in bonding with a parent. Yeah, and you know, I I, I think. I think that narrative is really important because you think about kids, young adults, teenagers who really grow up in this sort of quote unquote normal way, loving parents, bonded with your parents, and, and you have this struggle and it's, it's like, well, is this, is this the way life is just supposed to be? Is, and, and then you start fig- you figure it out that even though you're raised in a pretty healthy way, it still happens. None of us are exempt, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and as I started advocating across the world, I found myself speaking with folks who went through very similar experiences, albeit under different upbringings. Uh, and I started to understand that our experiences very much a universal one, and we are connected in all sorts of ways beyond the surface level. And, and you have been when you when you talk about um, all the places that you've been or that you've spoken, g- give us some context about what that really means. Because I, you really have done a lot of work with advocacy. Well, for me, again, it's part of my healing process. But you know, I went, I've been to Australia, um, setting up plans to go to other parts of the world, like India, the UK. And I work with an international NGO called United for Global Mental Health, which is focused on educating stakeholders in the policy realm and the government realm around what it means to establish systems change in mental health. And so that that helped me understand more of an international perspective. But on a national perspective, I, I had the great privilege of going to places like Minnesota and spending time in Duluth, where, I, where for me, a, a real magical experience was established. And I, and I owe it to you, Rick. Spending time in Duluth for me helped me understand that some of the greatest changes on a system level occur from a grassroots perspective, but also in terms of engaging stakeholders at the very top in a meaningful way. And for me, what the Miller Dwan Foundation helped me realize is that systems change required long-term focused resourcing and care from a number of different angles in the programming, awareness, research, advocacy, and policy uh, verticals. I've heard you talk about that. Those, I, I think there were five areas that you just talked about. Can you say them again just a little slower? Because I think they're all so incredibly important. Sure, yeah. So programming for me relates to developing curricula, digital resources and tools, or on-site, on-premise uh, experiences and services that help engage with people around an outcome-based approach. Nice. You know, okay. So if you have an outcome-based approach, someone might come in you know, prior to a service with anxiety or depression or potential suicidal ideation and through a service or a product experience, they come out the other side with reduced anxiety 
or alleviated depression and so forth. Um, that's sure. the programming side of thing. Awareness is very campaign based. Think of it as establishing things like marketing initiatives or uh, educational resources that help people change their way, change the way in which they think about the world and, and, uh, and the communities around them. And so stigma reduction is a large part of that, but also relates to, you know, having people understand that there's access to care and services and products in the first place. That's the second component. Research component is very much around, and I'm a big advocate for applied research. So if you think about scientists or clinicians, doctors, and so forth, um, doing research, the whole goal for me is to help them close the gap between the research they're doing, which you know ideally has efficacy associated with it, and bringing it out to the world. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So for me, I, I you know I would historically say research, but I've started to amend my approach to frame it as applied research. Got it. Yep. yep. So that's another uh, important vertical. And then on the advocacy side, really, that's around applying a strategic partnership based uh, uh, perspective, so that you can look at the different stakeholders in an environment, understand what services, products. Uh, resources are provided and figure out how all the dots can be connected to provide a dynamic support ecosystem. Sure. And then on the policy side, it really involves engaging the public sector, whether it's on a federal level or on a state level or on a municipal level, uh, understanding what resources are available and what resources aren't available, and then helping engage constituencies, whether they're, uh, you know, through politicians and and their different initiatives, or or on a grassroots basis, people based initiatives in terms of you know voicing their their opinions and their um, their their ability to to advocate for change, and and then ultimately translating that into effective policy that unlocks resources and services across the spectrum of, of uh, communities in need. And so in your experience in those five areas, and I, I think you probably have experience in all five, right? Um, where do you see, where would you see the greatest challenge? I mean, it, as we think about change and moving forward, scalable mental health interventions, growing a workforce, I mean, all of those things, um, I love those. I love those five. Actually, I, we, I think we had this conversation once before and I was busy writing everything down because I thought it was so cool. Um, so where do you see the biggest challenge with those five? Well, I think stigma plays a big part amongst different communities and cultures. Folks might not be wanting to seek help. It might be uh, stigmatized in such a way where they would feel that they would be judged or represented in a way uh, that might um, you know, prevent them from getting care or, or helping the people in their community get the care and support that they need. That's one component. There's a resourcing component. We simply need more funds and resources to train people, to establish the facilities and or digital tools that can then, you know, engage people where they need to be met. You know, the challenge is there's not enough psychiatrists and it's in, you know, who are, who are graduating through the system to support and service populations in need. The, the same applies to therapists. Uh, there are counties in the U S without any psychiatrists, but often, you know, the, the range of, of, uh, solutions, uh, from a resourcing perspective, go from, you know, one psychiatrist per 5,000 people to some areas where it's one psychiatrist per a few hundred people. But in most situations, it's, it's you know, one psychiatrist per 1,000 to several thousand. And that's not scalable. And then, you know, you look at triage solutions that launched during the pandemic. And, and often what they came down to was providing tech extenders or people extenders. There was an, an act that passed that, that helped nurse practitioners and registered nurse, uh, nurses provide uh, 
therapeutic and or in some situations, psychiatric care for folks. Um, then there was a reversion event in which, you know, some, you know, there was there was less care and less solutions available to people because, um, you know, you have a post pandemic ecosystem that's applied. So then the question is, how can we retrain or provide more opportunities for folks to establish the, the relevant accreditation so that they can then reignite or reestablish the care in a, in a, in a precise outcome oriented way. Yeah. So, and, you know, and as you, yeah, oh. as you well know, um, that's also part of, as we've had these discussions and we've gotten to know one another and the foundation really talking about what are scalable mental health interventions and how do we grow the workforce? Because exactly to your point, we can't hire our way out of this. Um, and so thinking about just that picture from like a, a provider standpoint and really having people who figuring out a sustainable model in which we really can help before it gets to the level of specialized care or, or um, needing to see a psychiatrist or needing therapy. Um, and, and before we sort of segue to a little bit more about the year visiting Duluth, um, can you tell us a little bit about PIM? Sure. So I launched PIM, which stands for Prepare Your Mind. It's not coincidentally my middle name. My family name is me. Yeah. Um, my middle name isn't Prepare Your Mind. It was just PIM. My, my father gave me the name. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and I created the company along with my wife, Olivia June Williams, uh, because when I was going through a transition period and discovering that service was my path to happiness and healing, I was still having a tough time. I was feeling dysregulated, experiencing more anxiety than ever. And I discovered that my diet actually was flagging in a bunch of different ways. And, and then as, as I started doing more research, I realized that the American public, uh, for the most part, does not have access to, you know, a, a, an optimal diet for mental well-being. This is the case throughout the United States. It's, all, it's also the case throughout many parts of the world. And the challenge relating to that involves getting you know, different elements of your diet uh, to support neurotransmitter synthesis. The spe specific ones are GABA, uh, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin. Uh, and there's different mechanisms for each one of those neurotransmitters. There's other ones like oxytocin, which relate to human connection and feeling connected with folks. But on the dietary level, I realized that there's certain fixes that could be applied for my own diet relating to things like supplementation and concentrated nutrition that provided a sea change for me, starting with GABA, but expanding into serotonin support, dopamine, norepinephrine, and so forth. For each one of your neurotransmitters, there's a way to integrate within your diet um, compounds that support optimal neurotransmitter synthesis. Fatty acids are also an important uh, um, ingredient for uh, omega, omega-6s, people might have heard of um, omega-3s and so forth, often find, found in, in some seafood, but also can be found in vegetation, uh, like algae and algae oil and so forth. Those are, are very much responsible for brain health and and the the underlying uh, foundational nutrition for things like cognition and so forth. And so, so in understanding what was deficient in my diet, I started establishing tweaks and changes, and that enabled me to feel better supported. And I launched the company uh, to the public in in 2020 with the goal of helping make <clears throat> with the goal of helping make nutrition for mental well-being a household phenomenon. Nice. Yep. And and now um, mood shoes, um, also things to help with attention, diet, and really, I mean, and it, it also speaks to your, your five core tenets um, of, because that's one big piece, right? Um, how are we taking care of ourselves? Because as advocates, as people who are working in the field of mental health, we need to take care of ourselves. Yeah, 100%. And, and what we started advocating for is something called mental hygiene. 
nice. looking at, at the I love it when you say that. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So we wanted to help educate folks around the premise that taking care of one's mental health should be a daily activity. It might, it, it needs to go beyond just meeting with a potential therapist or, right. or, you know, a psychiatrist once a week, we really need to look at expanding beyond because unfortunately high quality therapeutic care is generally unavailable to the majority of the U S population. Yep. yep. So, so in the meantime, until care is universally available, we need to look at solutions to put prevention and, and self care into, you know, our own hands, but, but from an empowering perspective. Yes. And, yes. and so what we want to educate people around is, and this is the tenets of, of mental hygiene is around all the elements they can do in their daily life to improve their mental health and resilience. So that's nutrition, fitness, mindfulness, meditation, therapeutic support, community support, and so forth. You make it sound all so eloquent and easy. It's amazing <laughs> how you do that. You have such good command of the English language. It always just impresses me. Oh, thank you. I trip over my own words sometimes. Uh, but, <laughs> I'm uh, not sure that I've ever heard that. But um, <laughs> so, so in our last few minutes, you, you've been to Duluth twice. You've been working with the, the Miller Dwan Foundation. I think every single one of us on staff, um, you've met or talked to or sat down with. You've talked to people in the Twin Ports. Um, talk about what you walked away with or what that experience was like um, and anything that you think is important for sometimes people who live here or live close to it don't quite understand. Um, so from somebody who's been all over the globe, your perspective would be tremendous. Well, you know, I, I touched upon it earlier, but the thing that stands out the most for me uh, is twofold. The people from Duluth are passionate and compassionate. That for me are the core drivers of systems change, passion and compassion. And that just came out in spades for me. It was something that I took home with me coming back. I look forward to. There's just a kindness and fire behind the eyes around the folks who really believe that change comes from the ground up. And, you know, I've seen it. You, you're, you are an inspiration to me, Rick. Oh, thank you. In terms of how your multi-decade journey has brought us to this point where the work you're doing, the work the Miller Dwan Foundation do, is doing, the work that's being done in Duluth and in Minnesota is now through initiatives like HopeX can now propagate throughout uh, the U.S. and the world. Yeah. And that's our goal. Yeah. And so yeah. so what became so apparent to me is through that compassion and passion is the catalyst for change throughout the world. Nice. And. And I think it's important to point out, I would say exactly the same thing about you. And right from the start, I mean, I, I was, of course, a little starry eyed when I met you the first time and couldn't speak quite as articulately now as I then as I can now. But um, that being said, you have such a tremendous heart and, and your heart and, and your lived experience and your advocacy and your your willing willingness to be a part of a journey of healing because of course you and i know i've been doing this for over 40 years um you're well on your way to a, just such a tremendous path of helping with change um and i i think when like minds and i'm not talking about brains like minds come together it, this is exactly what happens. It becomes serendipitous. It creates its own energy. And, and we all see that we want to be part of the solution. And, and so for everything that you did and everything that you've brought and helping us launch HOPEX, um, 
we're so incredibly grateful. Um, we really appreciate that. And I really appreciate you taking time out today. Um, it's just, it's been such a fabulous year and a half from the day I met you to where we are now. So many things have changed and our journey is just going to continue. And I can't wait, Rick. It's such a pleasure being your friend and, uh, Thank you for doing everything you do. Thank you. And so that's it for um, The Force for Good. Uh, you can find us on all social media. Keep an eye out. And please remember, join us in being The Force for Good. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>